Could you imagine Afghanistan, a country torn apart by war and poverty for half a century, now taking on one of the world's most massive projects itself? It's a true example of resilience and determination in adversity. Afghanistan is building a colossal artificial river known as the Kosh Tepe Canal. It's a 177 mile long, 152 meter wide and 8.5 meter deep river carved into the northern part of the country. This incredible project has been undertaken without any foreign aid or engineering guidance. What's the deal with the Kosh Tepe Canal, you ask? Well, it's a lifeline for the arid northern regions of Afghanistan, where people have been struggling with droughts and food shortages due to global warming and dwindling groundwater supplies. This canal will bring much needed water for irrigation and transform the region. But it's not all smooth sailing. Some neighboring countries that share the same river, the Amu Darya, have expressed concerns that the canal might affect their water supply. The Amu Darya, also known as the Oxus in ancient times, is a significant river located in Central Asia and Afghanistan. It begins its journey in the Pamir Mountains, north of the Hindu Kush. The Amu Darya is created when two rivers, the Vakhsh and the Panj, converge in the Tigro via Balkan Natural Reserve, situated on the border between Afghanistan and Tajikistan. From there, it flows northwestward into the southern remnants of the Aral Sea. As it travels through its upper course, the river acts as a natural border, marking Afghanistan's northern boundary with Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, and Turkmenistan. So, how did Afghanistan manage to embark on this epic endeavor? It's a story of defying odds, driven by necessity, and a testament to the strength of the Afghan people in the face of adversity. Although baffling, Afghanistan has fully taken on this massive canal project, providing water to over a million people and transforming thousands of acres into fertile farmland. This epic project, the Kosh Tepe Canal, kicked off in March 2022 and is divided into three phases. The first and second phases involve digging the canal, while the third phase focuses on setting up irrigation systems and essential infrastructure. Here's the kicker. Afghanistan is doing all this without the help from outside countries. The government is footing the bill, initially estimated at $500 million, but new projections suggest it might need an extra $100 million. You might be wondering how they're pulling this off with limited equipment, a shortage of experienced engineers, and no foreign assistance. Some critics in Asian media have been harsh, alleging mistakes and poor engineering. But don't be fooled, Afghanistan's government planned this meticulously. They started by conducting intensive land surveys and soil studies to ensure the canal's path was in the right place. They wanted to avoid the need for costly water lifts, prevent floods in winter, and ensure the soil was suitable for the project. They carefully selected flat land with a similar elevation to the Amu Darya river source area. Once the path was set, they divided the work among 200 private contractors across 114 sections, covering the first 67.1 miles of the canal. Thousands of workers, including haul trucks, excavator operators, and project engineers, rolled up their sleeves to make it happen. They've moved on to the second part, which is 100 nine miles long. Think about that. Rows of excavators, trucks, and skilled workers stretching as far as the eye can see, all working together to turn a daring dream into reality. Afghanistan's determination and careful planning will make the Toshkepa Canal a success. The process of building the Toshkepa Canal involved well-organized engineering and hard work. As the work progressed, it was all about precision and following the plan. Once engineers and supervisors dug and approved the section, the machinery would move on to the next section, replicating the process based on detailed maps and specifications. At the project's outset, they constructed 14 hydraulic gates, each topped with a bridge for vehicles. These gates served the crucial process during winter and heavy rains, preventing flooding when the Amu Darya river levels rose. The sections were separated by dirt walls, ensuring controlled filling and preventing soil erosion along the banks. They filled each section gradually, starting with the one closest to the Amu Darya River. When it was complete, the water flowed in, and the process continued to the other sections as the dirt walls were removed. Here's an interesting twist. Unlike some canals with concrete linings, the Kosh Tepe Canal didn't have concrete slabs on its floor and sides. This could be seen as good or bad, depending on who you ask. From their perspective, and considering that the Amu Darya water levels haven't dropped due to the filling, no concrete means more natural irrigation possibilities up to less than a mile away from the canal. It also helps maintain higher groundwater reservoir levels and backup water sources during droughts. Plus, there's the cost factor. Adding concrete slabs would have pushed the budget over by billions of dollars, something Afghanistan couldn't afford. In addition to the canal, two concrete bridges were constructed for the railway. Simplicity was the key, using solid reinforced concrete slabs cast on-site rather than pre-made. As this remarkable project continued, they didn't stop at the canal. 
They installed additional water mains to connect with water pumps in nearby villages and towns, ensuring more widespread access to water. During the final stages of Phase 1, they removed up to a million cubic meters of soil daily. This feat is even more impressive when you consider that many of the excavators and haul trucks they used were old, some dating back to the 1960s. They planted thousands of trees along the canal banks to fortify the soil and prevent erosion. They also set up a 12.4 mile area where they grew various crops to test the soil and see how well the irrigation systems worked. The impact on the local community has been substantial. The people living near the canal have experienced an economic boost, with thousands of workers finding employment, revitalizing old farms, and improving Improving roads. Contrary to some negative reports, all contractors and their workers have been paid well and on time. Uzbekistan, as the primary downstream country, has raised concerns about the potential negative impact of the canal on its agriculture. In 2023, Uzbek officials engaged in discussions with the Taliban regarding this matter, but no official agreements were reached at that time. This highlights the complex and sensitive nature of managing water resources that cross international borders and the need for diplomatic efforts to address potential conflicts and ensure equitable sharing of resources. Resources. There are valid concerns among environmental experts that the construction of the canal may worsen the already dire situation of the Aral Sea. Their worry is that by diverting additional water from the Amud Darya, the canal could further contribute to the shrinking of the Aral Sea, which has been suffering from significant water loss and environmental degradation for decades. Despite all the skepticism, some people are entirely on board. One fascinating aspect of this project is the diversity in the workforce and the high level of optimism and happiness among the workers, farmers and residents in nearby areas. These folks have endured decades of hardship due to wars, droughts, water scarcity and widespread poverty. The project is bringing a much needed change to their lives. Another exciting development is the widespread use of solar panels to power homes and workshops in these remote areas that were often cut off from the rest of the world due to a lack of electricity. Smaller solar panel fields are also emerging on the new farms to power water pumps. Additionally slated for completion in 2028, it now looks like they might wrap it up as early as 2025, given the current pace. Furthermore, more bridges and culverts are under construction, promising even more regional development. This project is a true game changer for Afghanistan and its people. In conclusion, it's important to recognize Afghanistan and its almost 40 million residents, mostly in rural and remote areas. They face severe famine due to harsh sanctions. As outsiders witnessing this project, we sincerely hope that more ambitious projects, focusing on water management, agriculture, electricity, and infrastructure will follow this incredible endeavor. This project holds the promise of helping Afghanistan recover from the scars of war and progress towards becoming a productive member of the international community. Now, here's a question for you. Can Afghanistan, under the rule of the Taliban, complete this massive project and embark on new ones? We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comment section. Please consider liking, sharing, subscribing and hitting the bell icon for more.